And joining us now for our Your Health segment is Dr. Lisa Schulman, professor of neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and co-director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Center at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. I suppose everybody has heard of Parkinson's disease, but maybe we should start with the basics. Um, what are the, the symptoms of it? How many people affected? That sort of thing. Sure. So I think many people think it's a Parkinson's disease is a disease of the elderly. Actually, the mean age of onset is about 60. So half of the people who do begin to have symptoms are really in the prime of their life. I think about Michael J. Fox. Who was unusually young when right. he first had the symptoms. The symptoms are most people understand as predominantly motor symptoms, problems with slowing, tremor, stiffness, trouble with walking, trouble with balance. But more recently, we understand that besides all that motor stuff, we also have what we call non-motor symptoms. And these involve things like emotional symptoms, cognitive changes, uh, changes with things like constipation, sexual function, so that it really runs the gamut. It's a very wide set of symptoms. I remember reading an article years ago where somebody described Parkinson's as a waiting room disease, meaning that the doctor could diagnose somebody while they were still sitting in the waiting room because of the um, very obvious and uh, signature uh, shakiness that people have. Can, can they have those non-motor symptoms without the shakiness? or it's all related? No, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say that the motor symptoms really predominate and that's how we really make, you know, the, the main cardinal symptoms are these motor symptoms, how we make the diagnosis. But we have to be clear that there's a lot of diagnostic inaccuracy in Parkinson's disease. Not everybody who has tremor or is slowing down has Parkinson's disease. There's plenty of other neurologic conditions and even medications that can cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. How do you make the diagnosis? Well, you know, one of the nice things about being a Parkinson's specialist is that the diagnosis is still made on the basis of a neurologic examination and history with a patient. It isn't as if you can do a lab test or an MRI of the brain and you get the diagnosis. Instead, it relies on the experience of a good uh, clinician. Do you see people uh, show up in, the, in your practice who have been diagnosed incorrectly? All the time. Really? That's very, very common both in terms of people thinking they have Parkinson's disease, but there's another underlying cause, uh, and vice versa, people who have been diagnosed with a, d a different condition and it turns out to be Parkinson's. If it's not Parkinson's, what does it tend to be? Well, there are other neurodegenerative disorders. Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative condition. Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative condition, but there's a whole host of others that very few people know about and those also cause Parkinsonism, or Parkinson's symptoms can result, as I mentioned before, by somebody's exposure to certain medications, and in some cases can even be reversed by stopping medications. So actually, in a textbook, you could have a whole laundry list of causes for Parkinson's symptoms. And you've written the book on Parkinson's disease. I don't have it in front of me, but mm -hmm. there's a, a picture of it. What's happening on the, uh, the treatment front? Well, you know, Parkinson's disease is kind of like a lot of chronic conditions that physicians deal with in that we have over the decades developed many more options for treatment that are very effective. Not the cures that, of course, patients are looking for once they develop a chronic condition, but because we have more and more medications, surgical options, better rehabilitation options, we are delaying disability in a very, very significant way. I mean, it, it was decades ago that a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease resulted in significant disability, let's say within five years. But today it isn't at all surprising to see people come in to uh, visit with us who have had Parkinson's for 10 years, 15 years, and even more, and are still living a very active life. Let's talk about how they go about living that active life while dealing with the, the symptoms of it, but, but also the psychological aspect and, and also the, 
the job that you have of managing your own condition? Well, that's one of my main interests, really. Uh, the fact is that it's very uh, become very timely and like a buzzword to talk about patient-centered medicine today. And what we mean well, by what that... What else would it be centered on if I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that if you go back a few decades, what a patient... A uh, physician visit was all about was the physician telling the patient, this is your diagnosis and this is what you should do, and that was the end of it. But today, the concept of patient-centered medicine is that the patient is increasingly empowered to be a very active part of decision-making. And that makes sense in terms of our whole information world, you know, but it actually is a whole new world in that, number one, patients need to learn a whole lot about their disease, about communicating with their physician, about managing their symptoms, because after all, you're just with your doctor half an hour uh, every few months, if you're but lucky, most of sure. the time you're on your own with your symptoms. But the really key part that I find most compelling about patient centered medicine is that people who are better self managers of their chronic disease have better outcomes over time. It isn't just a nice thing to do, it's the difference between better outcomes. What's the connection, do you think? Well, think about it. You know, somebody who uh, does not understand the symptoms of their disease well can't tell the difference between their disease symptoms and the side effects of their medicines, for example, is much more likely to be really anxious when they have things they don't understand and go see, go to the emergency room, end up being hospitalized more, end up seeing more consultants, more different types of doctors, more medications, and this is sort of a bit of a vicious cycle. Let's take a phone call. This is Mike in Queen Anne's County. Mike, thanks for calling. Go ahead. This is Reverend Rice to, for Dr. Schulman. Yes, what's your question? I. Uh just dumped a doctor who was pushing car Parkinson's disease to me uh, because I believe that all she was doing is an educated guess. And uh, I wondered if the doctor had any comments on that. You, you was, have stated that uh, you, you didn't have a blood test or anything like that for it. Interesting. Mike, thanks very much for the phone call. We'll get you an answer on the air. Whoops, wrong button here. So is it always an educated guess? Well, to some you degree? know, I mean, an educated guess really, I think, really doesn't do it justice. I right. mean, if, you, if this is what you are experienced in, then you, your accuracy of being able to make the diagnosis increases. In fact, studies show, even studies based on autopsy, that uh, the more experience somebody has in Parkinson's disease, and uh, I'm a movement disorder specialist, which means that I'm not just a neurologist, but somebody who has specialized in Parkinson's. And of course, the diagnostic accuracy of somebody who does it all the time is higher, let's say about 95%, compared to a primary care physician who may see Parkinson's much more rarely. So this gentleman would, uh, it would not be unreasonable to go seek a second opinion? Of a movement disorder specialist, right. yes. You know, coming back to the, the, um, the idea of, of um, patient involvement in their care, how do you feel as a physician when a patient comes in and they've spent a lot of time on the internet and they have a lot of questions as a result or maybe they think they know more than you do or I mean, there's so many different complications that arise. They'd like to be able to email you a question. It, it does complicate that old model of medicine that you were talking about that was pre-patient centric. And we have to revamp our entire way of doing things, our system, because that has changed. I mean, it is very, it, it, it is very challenging because, like you say, you know, sometimes somebody can come in with a file that's all their clippings and downloads and have so many things to discuss. They feel like saying, you know, when are we going to get to talk about you, you know, because it can be an obstacle. But we have to find some common ground to use it properly. And it, you, so you're happy to see a patient who's curious and, and, and involved? Absolutely. I know that they're going to do better if that's the case, because with an explanation, for example, for example, 
one of the areas that I've uh, researched is exercise in Parkinson's disease. And we've shown that people who exercise can improve, for example, their walking, their fitness. Dr. And somebody Shulman, who understands it more will do better. We're out of time. I apologize okay. for that, but thank you for coming in mm -hmm. and thank you for watching Direct Connection.